Welcome back after a summer off to Solving Basketball. This is Jordan Sperber, and today's guest is John Shire. As you probably know, he was an All-American at Duke, and now he's the associate head coach there. Thanks so much for taking the time to come on, John. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's been fun uh, following you and uh, looking forward to talking some hoops. I appreciate that. And the first question for every single guest, regardless of of, uh, basketball background, is if I walked into a gym with you right now and I went under the hoop, you went to the foul line and shot 100 free throws in a row, how many would you make out of 100? (laughs) <laughs> so actually I did this exact thing last week and I made 97 out of 100. 97. Wow. Okay. So I looked up the stats and you were you were 86% from your career, which I think might make you the uh the most qualified free throw shooter that we've had on the podcast. Yeah, I'll take it. You know, my 97 last week, it was an off week for me too. I think I'd be right around <laughs> 98 or 99 if me and you went right now today. Uh but yeah, so I uh I was fortunate to get to the free throw line a lot and uh, you know, my, my former teammates would always make fun of me that end of games, I'd run to the ball and just hold it. Uh, so I'd get <laughs> four or five extra points by getting fouled at the end of games. But it's uh, it's smart if you're making 86%, right? No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like asking this question. What have you found is the difference in, in percentages, whether it's you or, or your players now, now at Duke, between game and uh and practice like you said 97 was an off day what what were you hitting when when you were playing in your college career (laughs) right well it's it's a good question you know it's something actually we've uh done a lot of uh research and and work with some of our uh some of our guys on staff here just when we look at our practices and we see our shooting percentages how much does that translate to what we shoot in games? And, you know, we found, especially, you know, from preseason practice, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily translate that well. You you kind of need some gameplay to have an accurate number. Uh, but, you know, we have our guys shoot a ton of spot shots and we chart it. Uh, so it definitely translates to a certain extent, but obviously it's not the exact number that you would like, uh, that you would like to know or like to get. So it's something we're still figuring out, but, uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a fun process trying to figure that. What is basketball? What is what is what is, is, this, is this basketball? Is that basketball? What is what is basketball? I do think that you are number one now on the list, ninety-seven out of hundred, and I guess the proof to back it up if if you did it the other day. But let's. Let's stick with your playing career for a second here. I watched the 2010 National Championship game against Butler yesterday. I rewatched it. <laughs> and so you had five baskets that game. Uh, two were off like floppy action where you came off a pin down, curled into the lane. I think one you hit a floater and one was like a jump shot uh, from, from two. And you had one what I call boomerang three, which is where someone else came off a pin down. You pass them the ball and then relocated for, yep. for a three. That's like the Virginia, the Virginia action that they that uh, Kyle Guy scored a ton off this year. You had one put back uh, offensive rebounds um, right at the rim, and then you had one right hand iso off of a play that I know you guys still run a decent amount um, this year, and you ran a lot for Grayson Allen too. So my question based off of that is how much of the offense in 2010 uh, or just throughout your playing career is what we see now uh, in 2019 and moving forward uh, with with Coach K and Duke? You know, it's funny you you bring that stuff up. It's almost completely different. (laughs) You know, you're uh, and. You know, we had uh, we had this play we used to call it through where, you know, and it would be a play we'd run to and uh, it would be a play we would go to in key moments. We actually went to it when they cut it to one uh, and, and Singler actually had a really good look. It's a shot he normally hits from the elbow, uh, but it's where I hit the wing and you basically get into a floppy action. And, you know, one of our favorites that year became, you know, you call the boomerang action. But when you come off these pin downs and curl to hit it right back. Uh, up top because always that top guard is usually plugging or sinking down and so I remember in that three you can see I I remember hearing Brad Stevens on the sideline yelling not to do like as I'm shooting mid-motion 
you can see him react on the sidelines because it, it was clearly something they talked about not to leave because that was one of our favorite plays. And obviously, like you like you had mentioned, Virginia has been a uh, one of the best teams in the country at doing that. So uh, it's a lot. It's it's very different. You know, very different personnel. We always try the best we can every year to adjust to what our strengths are as a team and what our weaknesses are. And so offensively, uh, obviously, there are some things you, that are consistently good, but uh, we try to change. We try to change a lot from year to year. I will say that year in 2010, we changed as much as anything because uh, change as much as any team. Excuse me, because uh, we were together for three or four years. You could do a little bit more, uh, and we had a type of team that uh, needed each other in order to score, which is important. Yeah, that makes sense. The thing that I noticed about that team was like when you guys ran floppy or, or it sounds like maybe that, that through play you talked about, you had three guys that could come off screens, um, yourself, Nolan Smith, and uh, Singler. And so two of you would be running off the screens, then you'd pass to to one and then go right back into it with the new right, two guys. exactly. And you probably didn't see that as much from a team like you had last year where you would run some a pin down maybe for Cam Reddish or, or, or R.J. Barrett um, and then play from there as opposed to staying with it. I don't think it's necessarily good or bad one way or the other. Like you said, it's about fitting the personnel. The crazy thing is that with all the different personnel that you've had, you guys have been top 10 in offensive efficiency every single year um, since you guys graduated. Right. What's the process to figuring out how you're going to play in that given year, uh, especially with such young teams? No, it's a great question. Well, I think it starts with understanding who we have and uh, what are our strengths. And that's something Coach does a great job of. And as a staff, we talk about constantly. And it starts in the summertime when you get to know them. And, you know, obviously through, throughout the recruiting period, you have an idea of who guys are you know them even better when you go through a summer of being together, right? So, you know, for our freshmen, I know, and Coach knows, and our staff knows who Matthew Hurt is, who Vernon Carey, Cassius Stanley, Wendell Moore. We know who these guys are way more now than we did before the summer started, obviously. And so then for us, you know, one thing that, that Coach is one of his biggest strengths and something they, you know, is incredible with is is teaching guys reads. And so no matter – what offense we put in, how much structure, what actions or sets um, or quick hitters. We have a lot of things that we call quick hitters. Um, he wants to always show guys you, you, you have the ability to break off a play, but here's the read. Like here's different times when you're going to have opportunities to drive, opportunities to shoot, opportunities to make a play. And so I think throughout time, when you look at Duke's offense and you know, you, you go back to us in the old days in 2010 to now 2019 and uh, this upcoming season, uh, that's something that is consistent. The ability to, to make reads and to follow your instincts. With that being said, is there a style that Coach K or, or, or the program in general would like to play? Or at this point, is it is it just player driven where, it, you know, you, you just – it, that's how it is. You're going to react to when you have Bagley and Carter, you know, you're going to run more high, low stuff versus, you know, right. depending on the year. You know, I, I don't know that there is one way, uh, you know, I really don't. I think when you look at our teams throughout the years, when we've had, uh, you know, we've always had great spacing, you know, the last couple of years has been unique because we've had incredibly gifted players that teams we're trying to do anything they could to keep us out of their paint. So these last two years, when you talk about Marvin and, and Wendell, and obviously we had, you know, shooting even with that team uh, uh, and Gary and, and, and Grayson. And then obviously last year when you had uh, RJ Zion and Cam, uh, teams would do whatever, whatever they could to keep us out. But, you know, drive and kick, uh, four or five guys on the floor that can shoot. That's been, that's been something that we've had you know, throughout the years, at least three guys, you know, that can really knock them down. And so but we've been able to play different ways and adjust to. And like you said, we've been, you know, right there, right, right near the top, if not at the top, you know, really uh, close to every year. Right, exactly. The the team, uh, really, these last two teams, especially this past year with, with a lack of three-point shooting, 
you would think that maybe uh, efficiency would would dip, but it really hasn't. Like you said, with this past year, defenses were very, very uh, invested in shrinking to the ball and and closing driving lanes for RJ and Zion. So what, uh, I guess, conceptually in the offense did you focus on with the other guys, you know, the, the Trey Joneses and Jack Whites? With, with those guys in terms of uh, how to play against that sagging defense? Yeah, well, it's it's, uh, it's it's different as a player, right? Because, you know, I can still be shooting a good percentage and teams are going to still live with me shooting, even though I'm a good shooter and, you know, there's a certain percentage I may be hitting, right? And so that's something you have to adjust to. I think the biggest thing for us was uh, trying to figure out different spots to operate right for these guys but also being able to move without the ball and so uh that's something you know really uh done the stretch of the acc tournament uh when we won it uh then the ncaa tournament which obviously we had some incredibly close games and you know we're a minute away from having a chance to go to a final four uh being ready without the ball and it, it wasn't we found that we didn't need to complicate our offense because we really would get good shots just by Zion and RJ drawing a lot of attention uh, and just knocking them down and <laughs> shooting the ball freely. And I think that's, you know, something that's important to do. Like when you have an open three, there's no hesitation. That's the right play. Just shoot it. And so, uh, you know, end of the day, we're going to live with that and uh, thought our guys did a very good job of trying to attack it uh, that way then. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was thinking while watching that. 2010 game is like this it wouldn't necessarily make sense you were so good running off sc- floppy screens and pin downs but it wouldn't make sense to have zion doing that for for 40 minutes when you know he can just dribble to his left and create a, a good <laughs> shot for someone right yeah and you know in the day i mean zion uh showed he's a very capable shooter but even with zion people are playing way off of him because that's what that's what people are going to live with and so if he comes off uh you know, any screens, people are just going to go under because that's what they're going to, again, it goes back to what they're going to live with this year because he, he scored at such an efficient level in the paint and at, and at the rim. Psychologically for, for the sagging off or, or going under screens, uh, is it just constantly empowering the guys to, to take the shot when you're open? Is that, you know, reinforcing it? Big time. Uh, I think it's the uh, mentality and, you know, we've had uh, obviously we've had a lot of young teams the last few years, and uh, the the biggest thing with young players is you don't have to you don't have to catch the especially not just young players but young really talented players you don't have to catch the ball ready all the time. And you know, Jason Tatum obviously now he's playing for the USA national team has had you know two incredible years in the NBA. He was always able to just catch the ball and now I'm going to make a play one-on-one and I'm going to create a great shot. And, you know, especially when you get to college, when you don't have the spacing, like you will, you know, at the NBA, at the NBA level, you need to catch it ready to shoot or to make a play quickly. And so that's something for our guys. Like when, when you have this and when you have the opportunity to shoot when you're open, it's an automatic shot. There's no hesitation. There's no thinking Like we want you to take that shot and to, and to be prepared to to do that. So that's something that took us a little time to get used to. But I thought by the end of the season, you know, our guys for the most part were, you know, ready to catch and shoot and to make teams pay. And so, you know, we had some games we didn't shoot as well. And we had some games that we actually shot it really well. So it just that's how the game goes. I wish I wish you could make them all. Right. The two games that come to mind where you guys shot it lights out was Virginia, for sure, those, those two games. Even the Michigan State game, um, like really, the whole NCAA tournament, it's, it, there, there was a lot of shrinking to the ball. But for the most part, you made him pay, I think. Like, Trey Jones, I thought, showed a lot of growth in the NCAA tournament. He, he played really well offensively. They were just close games at the end of the day. Well, at the end of the day, the, the margin of error is, is so small, right? And, you know, you could go through that game. And, again, as a coach, I think you always want to go back and say, what could we have done differently or – you know, I would do this, and uh, why did I do this? But at the end of the day, it comes down to a play or two, and you could say that for either team in that game. And you look at all of the games in the Elite Eight last year, they all came down to one play. <laughs> you could change one play 
and that's the difference of winning and losing. And so, you know, you could, uh, I'm not going to pick out one particular play from that game for us, but there's plenty of opportunities where I could do that. Right. And so that's, that's what it comes down to. Sometimes it's a play here or play there. If we switch over to defense here for a second, uh, the one thing that, that uh, well, maybe not the one thing, but I think the main thing that Coach K defenses have always, always been elite at is three-point defense. So right. both limiting attempts and the percentage pretty much throughout his career. So is that because of the scheme? Is that just the overall philosophy? Why has the three-point defense always been so good at Duke? Well, I think it's something that Coach K, you know, he just has always had a great understanding of it at an early stage of, uh, look, threes are worth, worth more than two. It's pretty simple, right? And so defending the three-point line and making making players who aren't as comfortable making plays do that. And so, you know, defending the point line is constantly something we talk about with our team. Uh, and another aspect would be playing without fouling. And, you know, obviously this is never something you can do perfectly, uh, but we try the best we can, like every team does, right? You always try the best you can to not hurt yourself. And the best way to do that is not give up open threes and to not bail guys out by fouling them and make them, making them hit tough twos, right? And so that's something uh, that coaches always emphasize and we always – have done a pretty good job of, you know, throughout the years. How does the the pressure, so a lot of Duke teams have gotten, especially the ones that played man-to-man, have gotten pretty heavy into denying one pass away and really being the aggressor on defense. So how does that relate to three-point defense? Let's say let's say on a, on a backdoor cut or something like that, are you still prioritizing staying on shooters from there? We are. And, you know, something we, we stress a lot, Jordan, is understanding where the help comes from, right? And, uh, you know, we're not a team. Uh, you'll see as, as throughout the years, we do a pretty good job of understanding who's the help guy. And so in certain situations, you get two or three guys running, running at the ball to stop it. Whereas for us, we have, you know, let's say the big comes over to help, then the guards are spraying out and they're getting, they're getting the shooters. And so, you know, understanding one, not over helping and then two, understanding where the help comes from, uh, I think are important points and something that we've tried to do. I think we've also found, you know, the last few years we've had to simplify what we do and try to just be really good at whatever our key habits are that we want our guys to uh, be great at. Has that involved more switching? I know that this year's team switched a lot. I'm not really sure, like when you played, how much right. did, did you guys switch a lot when you were playing, or is that a, a more recent trend? You know, we did, uh, you know, but I think it goes back to personnel again because, you know, when I was, let's say, my team in 2010, we had Lance Thomas at the four and Kyle Singler at the three. That Lance Thomas is one of the best defenders I've played with or, or coached and uh to have that luxury of him and then you know nolan smith and i were bigger guards and so the ability to switch one through four we could do and this year we had a team that could switch one through four and one through five a lot and so that simplifies it but you know one of the things i just want to hit on you know you mentioned our our pressure defense and contesting uh a lot of times what that does is it takes teams out of their normal offense and so you know, really breaks down to two things then. It breaks down to one-on-one defense controlling the ball, and it breaks down to ball screen defense. And so that's something we've, uh, you know, played differently throughout the years. And at the end of the day, I mean, that's – I think you look at the NBA, look at college, that's where the game comes down to a lot. And so those are, you know, two important areas to be really good at. Right. That's a great point. It's something that I've looked at a lot this summer, almost regardless of if you're pressure and denial or pack line. So when you're pressure and denial, you're you're d- being so disruptive and they can't run their regular stuff. And like you said, it goes to um, isolations and, and or, or ball screens. And then the opposite end is is pack line, uh, you know, a team like Virginia, where 
you are running your stuff, but you're just not scoring. So you get into late clock situation. And then again, it comes down to uh, ball screens or, or ISOs. And that was that's something that I've written about a little bit is that elite teams, almost regardless of, of what they are, they force a lot of isolations. And yeah, I think even uh, Bolden, when, when he was at the five last year, I think he did. a. I remember the Syracuse game specifically. He, he was really good um, moving his feet and at least contesting shots in isolation uh, situations, right? No, no question. And, you know, when you have guys, you know, we were fortunate to have two guys last year, really three three guys because Zion was at that spot for some. Uh, but then, you know, Marquise and Javin, where they're able to use their length and size, uh, you think you can get by them, but all of a sudden, you know, they recover at you and they get a block or – at least they contest the shot to a point where you end up missing. Uh, that's that's difficult to have a steady diet of that. And so uh, that was a really good defense for us this past year. Not saying we're going to play it that same way. You know, we still need to get to know our team better for this year. But for last year, it, it really fit what we were trying to do. The one game I, or games I wanted to bring up about the switching was against Virginia. I remember listening to Coach K's presser, and if I remember correctly, he credited you. Did you have the Virginia scout for the switching the blocker mover stuff? Yeah, you know, we, we, we do our scouts more in teams, okay. but that was something we talked about as a staff. But anyway, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. The blocker mover stuff, I, from the year before, right. you guys had been really hurt on Kyle Guy and Ty Jerome playing off pin downs. And really from the jump, I believe, in, in, in game one, you switched everything, which there's a lot of different ways that people have, have guarded Virginia. But for whatever reason, it didn't seem like anyone had really switched one through five. No. Yeah. So how do you make that decision or, or what leads to that decision um, especially because a lot of those guys weren't on the team the year before, you know, Zion, RJ, you right. know. and then, and then also if you don't have any film to sort of, to, to see how it's going to look, if teams haven't done it, what's the process to, uh, to doing sort of a, a unique scouting decision like that? Well, I, I think when you're facing a team like Virginia last year and they were a, a really good team, uh, you always want to think about, what is going to hurt you the least, right? And, you know, something that happened the year before with them, and I don't know if you necessarily get an appreciation for this on TV, uh, but they, everyone talks about their defense, but they, they wear you down with their offense. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're physical screeners, uh, Jerome and Guy in particular. Hunter, too, though, can do it, uh, where they're terrific I mean, they are high level running off those screens uh, and reading each other. And the threes burn you. And look, in the day, we can talk about how we're going to chase them on screens and lock in. When you're, when you're defending a guy like uh, Jerome or Guy, they're going to get some looks. They are if you defend it that way. And so we weren't willing to concede those looks. And we would rather switch out, switch one through five, and if that meant – uh, them throwing the ball into the post and trying to play one-on-one, or Jerome or Guy now playing one-on-one against Zion, Bolden, uh, Javin, Jack White. Uh, we were we were willing to live with those consequences. We felt like that was the best chance that we had to win uh, and, and for our defense to succeed. Uh, and I think also we had uh, on our side the fact they had never seen that uh, seen that defense before was also a a benefit more for us rather than for them. So how about going into game two? Now they have seen that defense before, so so you (laughs) don't have the element of surprise. You obviously you won, you won both games and you you stayed with the switching. Was there a conversation about, about not doing that, even though it was pretty successful in game one? Yeah, of course. I mean, look, you're playing as high level coaches and you know, they're, (laughs) It happened to be where that week they, they had a week off before playing us, and so we knew they would be prepared for the switching. So we talked about doing it selectively. Uh, you know, not if you look back at that first game. I mean, we were doing it no matter what. Like I, I was, and which which they should have because that's what we told them to do. Uh, so we talked about doing more selectively. But at the end of the day, you either you either do it or you don't. And we we felt like doing it would be the best thing, uh, and we try not to do it. Uh, we, we, we went over some specific situations where we didn't want to uh, and, and could 
teach how to do it better than we did the first time. And so our guys, I give them credit because uh, they're the ones who put it into action. And, you know, when you're switching, especially, you know, in a loud arena, like you have to be loud. You need, you need, we always say command it. They, they commanded our defense. They did a great job with it. And then end of the day, it was great one-on-one defense and being disciplined on, on Jerome and Guy and staying at home. So our, our guys uh, definitely made it happen. So having gone up against those group of guys from, from Virginia so much, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Which one are you most excited that is gone? <laughs> <laughs> you got to pick well, one. Uh, first of all, it's all of them, you know, of course. <laughs> but uh, no, you know what? They, they, they all brought something different to the table. I can't, I can't just single one of them out. You know, I think, uh, you know, Jerome was always the guy we talked about, though. End of game, end of clock. He believes their team is supposed to win, and like he's he's the guy. You know, Jerome was the one who uh, seemed like his swagger, his confidence, you know, carried their team. And obviously, Hunter, you know, is a unique player for college. And guy, what he does shooting and scoring the ball is unique. But man, I'll tell you what, uh, all those guys are are big time college players. Yeah, agreed. So if we uh, switch topics here to to a little bit of, of analytics, you probably aren't aware of this, but that 2010 national championship team was actually a pretty big win for analytics. So I, I'll, no, I'll I'm, aware. A... I'm aware. Oh, okay, of that. okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected. So um, yeah, at the time, I, let's see, I was a junior in high school in 2010, and a a huge Kempom rankings. Uh, supporter. It wasn't quite as mainstream as it is now. It's kind of, there's a couple of things that are weird to think about from, from that. People were skeptical of Kempom at the time, which isn't necessarily the case. And people were skeptical of Duke, which doesn't right. usually, you know, that's, that's unusual. So you right. guys, I think you opened the season eight or nine in the, in the preseason AP poll and didn't didn't go above five until March. Uh, so that was Kansas was number one for most of the year, and Kentucky that was the John Wall Demarcus Cousins team. Uh, but you were number one in Kempom for like I think maybe the whole year or, or very right. close to the whole year. So the win was was validation for for analytics in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so it sounds like you're aware of that now. Were, were you aware of it as a player or later on? Well, I was uh, not necessarily aware of the analytics during the uh, during the season, but I, I felt like we had the best team. And I, I no question knew people were sleeping on us or felt like uh, we were the worst of the best teams. I remember, you know, after the after the, you know, uh, the brackets come out, right? Everybody's saying their opinion. And I think all the analysts said Duke's going to be the first number one seed to lose, you know. And, um, you know, I know we were – top five in both offense and defense efficiency uh, looking back. And again, not during the season, cause you didn't, you didn't talk about analytics like that. <laughs> I feel like at that point, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but looking back, I've had a chance to, you know, know one, how special that team was. And also some of the things we did, we need to continue to do. Uh, but we would probably even play a little differently now knowing where the game is going. Like, I think we'd be a team that shoots even more threes than we shot, you know, and uh, some, some little things like that. Got it. Yeah. Between that win and then ironically, Brad Stevens, who, who you played um, in that national championship there, an article came out about how he used analytics. And I don't think that we've really looked back (laughs) since, since then. Um, Right. So what, what has your exposure been as, as a player or a coach to, to learning more about it and, and using numbers in whether it's team improvement or scouting or, or whatever? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it started as a player when I was here. And like I said, you know, we never, the coaches never used the word analytics, but the way they taught us was what analytics are today, right? Like on offense, you know, we're always taught we want to get to the rim. We want to kick out threes. And we want to be the other team in the foul line. We want to get to the foul line more than we put the other team at the foul line. And so I think it starts there with shot selection and understanding what you're trying to accomplish on offense. Uh, And so I I think I got a really good base when I was at Duke 
Uh, and then I was fortunate my first year out, uh, I had, uh, you know, a few things happen where, you know, I played with Miami Heat, the summer league, uh, went to Clippers, a train camp. And then I ended up in the best situation I could have ever gone. I went to the Houston Rockets G league team, G league affiliate, uh, real grand Valley Vipers. And I played for a guy named Chris Finch. And, you know, at that time, you know, the Rockets were obviously they've been ahead of the curve with analytics and, uh, they're, they're very, uh, strong in what they believe in they had us experimenting in the g league what would it do if four guys go to offensive glass every time and so you know when we were playing shot goes up if you're not the one taking the shot you're going to the boards <laughs> and that was something they were trying to look at and then obviously uh you know chris is one of the best offensive minds uh in in the game today period regardless of what level uh and so when you talk about analytics, teaching us the numbers and the amount of threes that we took, we took a ton of threes. And then obviously we were trying to get to the rim and shoot free throws. So it started there for me. And then as a coach, uh, just really doing your homework, right? And the numbers don't lie. And, you know, I heard a thing, you know, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And that's from my guy, Chris Finch. And uh, it's, uh, it's true. You know that better than anybody that once you, once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> when you're, let's say you're going to uh, starting to look into a team on a, on a scouting report. This is a question that we brought up on the podcast in the past. Do you want uh, numbers first? I know a lot of people print out that a lot of assistant coaches print out that cumulative box score. That's like the, the Holy grail when it, when it comes to scouting. Um, right. Do you want the numbers first? Do you want the video? Are you just kind of using them both simultaneously or, or what's your process there? Yeah. You know, I, I like to do it where I get a certain amount of information. I, I need to watch it, you know? And so I like to get the stats, uh, obviously, of course, the Ken Palm sheet. And um, I don't like looking at the numbers, you know, our guys do a great job of giving us, you know, everything we could ask for in terms of, you know, is he, uh, the, the shot chart, you know, does he prefer going right? Does he prefer going left? Whatever it is, I like to get to know a team before I look at those specific numbers uh, because in the, the day, I, I think sometimes the numbers can fool you in certain circumstances, but uh, obviously uh, percentages uh, uh, from the field and free throw line and assist to turnovers, those don't. Those are reality, right? Um but that's something I like to get to know the team more on film. I need to watch them before letting all the stats tell me who the team is, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And even it's not necessarily that the numbers lie, but there's context to everything. So a 40%, yeah, 40% three point shooter. If it's a John Shire running off pin downs all game, that's different than a 40% shooter. Um, that that's like a trail four that takes, you know, like Luke May or, or someone like that. Of course. But I actually think it's the same way with, with film too. So it's not that film lies, but it takes a while to understand what you're watching. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's like that. I, this doesn't get talked about a lot with, uh, with scouting, but it's like a constant process of, trying to figure out what you're watching and then going back and, okay, now this makes more sense in the context of the offense. And that's probably why against a team like Virginia, um, you can do some more advanced game planning stuff because you're so familiar with them. Right. Right. No, it's, it, you know, it's a great point. And, you know, if you just watch the two games prior to which you're playing them, there's no question that that does not tell the whole story. Right. And especially for us, people play us differently than they play some other teams, whether it be because of our athleticism and size or because of the way we play defense. And so it's important for us to, uh, you, if you just watch how they're playing and think that's going to translate to how they're going to play Duke, you're fooling yourself. <laughs> and so you need to make sure, like you said, the context is key with all of this and being able to you know, add the pieces together uh, and, and figure it out. So that's something I always try to watch games where the offense plays a defense that's similar to ours. So, mm -hmm. you know, Florida State is a is a good example of 
how they like to pressure and they have good athletes and they're long. And, uh, so again, not to say we're the same, but try to get a sense of, uh, you know, similar teams is, is helpful as well. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I, I remember Florida state played Gonzaga in the NCAA tournament and right. I did some prep for that. And I watched when both those teams played Duke, you know, they say they have the length and the athleticism and yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So what about analytics uh, with the players as a former player? Uh, like you said, you played in that Rockets D league team did you find their commitment to eliminating mid-range getting to the rim getting to threes did you find that restricting or or i guess were you empowered by it (laughs) well you know at first it was a little just mind-boggling you know because as a player one of the things i always held my hat like one of the things i always uh felt very confident in is my is my mid-range game (laughs) that's that's my go-to, you know, because I wasn't a guy that was as athletic. I wasn't going to jump over you. Uh, but I could always get, you know, some good space and just uh, shoot a little leaner in, in the lane or uh, a, a pull-up J. That was just something I always did. And so uh, you need to uh, – I have empathy for, for players going through that transition. And we don't – by the way, for us, we never tell our guys you can't take – pull up twos or that's not what we're doing. We, we don't, we don't talk to our guys uh, in that way or limit them in that way. We try to just teach shot selection. And so, you know, this is a good shot. Now let's make it a great shot. And so it was a little bit of an adjustment for me, but once I saw why we're doing it, uh, it just took off. It, it makes, it made complete sense to me at the time. And first of all, at Duke, but second of all, for me, it's not um, – analytics is an amazing tool, right? But situationally and, you know, as a player, you need to be able to follow your instincts. And so at times we want our guys shooting pull-ups. And at times you're, you're, it's not going to be perfect, right? And, the, and the, at the end of the day, you want to be number one in everything uh, and you want to do everything uh, the right way, but that can't substitute – you not following your instincts or you being robotic, like you need to, players need to play. (laughs) And so I think that's a huge point just for us, something that we try to do and that coach is the best at uh, is letting our guys, giving our guys the freedom still to go, to go after it. Because look, I I use this as an example, right? I mean, we're playing uh, Kentucky first game of the year in the champions classic. We're playing, uh, Texas Tech in the Garden right before Christmas. We're playing Michigan State in the Elite Eight. Uh, you can't be afraid in those situations. <laughs> and so the last thing you want to do is overthink or be cautious. And so at the end of the day, we want our guys to not be afraid and to go out there and just give it their all. And so that's, I, I think that's an important point. And one of the things I've learned from Coach throughout the years is, you know, he, I think he does that better better than anybody. Last question. Is there a fine line between getting everything you can out of the Duke team, but also helping the one and done talent that you guys have in the trajectory of their career? So obviously the NBA has gotten away from mid-range and the pull-up jumpers, but a lot of the guys who take those shots are the one and dones that you're getting, uh, you know, like RJ Barrett, you know, if, assuming he develops into a lead scorer in the NBA, he's probably going to be someone who takes some mid range shots. Right. Is balancing that something that you guys think about the, the future of their career as well as the team aspect? Obviously along with winning games, you're trying to teach guys constantly how to get better and certain things they have to do. And so I think naturally what we teach our guys they learn that for the next level, not just Duke. I think it goes hand in hand. And it's just like some of the skill work we do. Does it translate directly over to the next game? Or is it the process of becoming the best player you can be? And so I think it goes hand in hand. And just like anything, shot selection is a huge thing. And I think Duke is, when guys come to Duke, it's really the first time you have to learn that because in the high school setting, uh, you're so dominant and it's, you're, you're such a, 
you're by far the best player. You don't necessarily, you, you just don't have to do that in high school. And so mm -hmm. college is the first time they have to learn it. It's a constant process. And, you know, I feel proud, you know, the guys we've been able to coach and teach. And by the, by the time they left, I, I feel like they've all gotten a lot better um, uh, to be prepared for, for the NBA, of course. Yeah, well, you definitely have a unique perspective given you played at such a high level. You've been around all these top level um, NBA talent as a coach now. And I really appreciate your time and coming on the podcast, John. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. And just before I let you go, I'm going to flip it on you. If you were to walk in the gym with me and shoot 100 <laughs> free throws, what are you going to hit? I am not getting 97, but but I'll, I'll say I'll say 87. I I can hit some free throws in a row. All right. Yeah, yeah, 87. All right. I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you having me on. Thanks again, Jordan. Thank you, John. No hand checking. Michael Jordan, Scott Pippen, Tony Kukoc.